If you want to play the Sega Genesis the way it was meant to be played, you should use composite video. But why? RGB output looks amazing, especially on the Genesis. Why would you even consider using composite video? The answer is dithering. I feel that this subject is lost due to the recent surge of interest in professional video monitors and upscaling devices, so let's talk about it. By making use of detailed pixel patterns in its graphics, the Sega Genesis used dithering to simulate transparency and create additional colors when the console's video signal was displayed on a television. This was achieved by leaning heavily upon the degraded image fidelity found when using a composite video signal. When you use a superior quality signal such as RGB, the dithering process is incomplete as the compromising of the details, so to speak, is no longer performed. Many feel that the overall image improvement gained from using an RGB video signal rather than using composite video is well worth the sacrifice of a completed dithering process. As you know, there are various types of analog video signals transported via various types of connectors. Component, S-Video, Composite, and RF via coax are a few of the cables used to transport video from an output device to a display device. They exist so video can be broadcast or stored using less bandwidth than RGB. Originally, we only needed a brightness signal for TV. When Color TV arrived, color was mixed into that signal to maintain backward compatibility for black and white TV sets. The various analog video standards descended from this simple two-step approach. Number one, take a black and white signal, and number two, now what the heck are we going to do about color? The human eye can perceive brightness details much more than it can color details, so it makes sense to focus on reducing color information in order to save bandwidth. Color bandwidth and therefore color resolution is compromised the further you travel down the quality ranking for analog video. When you reach the point of combining the brightness and color information into one signal, you will experience a notable reduction in color detail versus the original RGB signal and notice instances of visual artifacts in the picture. Both computers and consoles have embraced and exploited these two results of bandwidth reduction and this is key when it comes to making an argument for composite video. Let's take a look at how color is included in the various video standards. Component video and S-video provide separated brightness and color information of the original RGB signal. These signals are referred to as Luma and Chroma. A display can take these separate components and use them to derive a fairly decent representation of the original RGB signal. Composite and RF, however, contain a combined Luma and Chroma signal. The display then has to separate the brightness and color information before proceeding to reproduce an RGB signal. The separation process, or filtering, of the chroma from the luma can vary in quality depending on the types of filters used. The typical filter used for this process is called a comb filter, and there are various types. Some sort of filtering method is needed to separate luma and chroma where composite video and RF are used, and a superior comb filter in your CRT costs you more money. Sometimes the separation process incorrectly interprets luma information as chroma information and vice versa, resulting in visual artifacts in the image. Take the color bleed check screen from the 240p test suite, for example. The bottom set of lines alternate between black and white. When viewed using composite video, there is color there where we know there should not be. This is because brightness information is being interpreted as color information. On the flip side, color interpreted as brightness, we sometimes see dot crawl, such as the odd appearance of bright squares in the orange letters on this screen. The graphical output of the Sega Genesis used dithering combined with the degraded fidelity of composite video to help simulate transparency and additional colors. The most often cited example of this is a waterfall in Sonic the Hedgehog, so let's see how it's done. I'll start with an emulator to walk you through the various graphics involved in the dithering process. Let's disable the sprites used so we can focus on the waterfall. The background is made up of two layers, the far background that is behind the waterfall and the near background that contains the waterfall itself and the surrounding terrain. The waterfall is made up of four shades of blue in single pixel width columns that have a one pixel width gap between each column. The movement of the waterfall that you see is actually a static image undergoing a palette cycle. A palette cycle is the process of taking a defined number of palette positions, four in this case, 
and cycling the values of each of the four in the same order. It creates an illusion of animation without taxing the processor. In addition to the near background, the far background also uses the technique for a waterfall and shimmering on the water's surface. Layering the two backgrounds creates a dithered pattern with a plethora of color detail. When this is converted from RGB to composite and back again, the fine detail of the colors is lost, and they appear blended together, producing what to us is simply a semi-transparent waterfall. Here is a real-life example. The same waterfall running on a Sega CDX hooked up to a Sony PVM via RGB. The alternating lines of waterfall and those of the far background are just as jarring as they were in the emulator. Now here is the same scene using the same console and display, but connected via composite video. Notice the compromised details result in a semi-transparent waterfall, a creation of extra colors that aren't in the Genesis palette, and a bit of a rainbow effect. Here is the same scene in composite video on a 2005 TV. The water blending is there, and the rainbow effect is also there. Here is a capture of the system using the FrameMeister upscaler. Same story. And as an added bonus of shock value, <laughs> here is a Model 1 Genesis with bad combining of the chroma and luma signals. Same 2005 TV set, and therefore same comb filter circuit, but improper creation of the composite video signal. I assume this is an example of a terrible amount of luma information being present in the chroma signal. Let's take a look at a slightly more active example, Shinobi 3. This particular area makes use of dithering in a couple of places, the pool area and the waterfalls. Both instances allow sprite information to appear and pass behind them for added effect. This footage is from the 2005 TV. Whereas the sonic scene I used require a bit of time to stop and smell the roses to see composite video artifacting in effect, Shinobi 3 puts it right in your face. If we examine the same scene in an emulator, you can see the checkerboard dithering in the pool area and vertical lines for the waterfalls, just like in Sonic. As a side note, there are actually two sets of palette cycles going on here, one for the far background and one for the near background. With the double palette cycle and dithering in place, I think the graphics make for a great atmosphere. Now let's focus a bit more on extra color creation. The title screen of Sonic 2 uses a checkerboard pattern combining five different shades of blue and white horizon to produce a gradient. The checkerboard pattern is easily observed in the emulator and creates extra colors with composite video, effectively producing a smoother gradient. One wonderful example of dithering for the purposes of color and shading is this level loading screen from Earthworm Jim. An emulator naturally shows the raw makeup of this screen quite well, and you can observe instances of checkerboard patterns in the eyes and face, as well as the alternating vertical line technique, especially along parts of his uniform at the back. Also note the tip of his gun. A red glow is made using a combination of bright red, very dark red, alternating vertical lines close to the tip of the gun, and dot work further away from the tip. The same details can be observed in the RGB signal on a PVM. There are a few anomalies from capturing it with my camera, but the separation of lines and dots can still be seen. Now the same capture using composite video on the PVM. Notice how the intricate checkerboard and line work has blended in on his face and his eyes. The backpack has more of a gradient look to it, and the tip of the gun looks like it is glowing instead of a smattering of pixels. Here is the same image using the 2005 TV, the anomalies are not as pronounced as my footage of the PVM. You can see the smooth gradient in the uniform at the back. Obviously, anything from a CRT is going to look better in person, but I think this composite video-based image is a much more organic representation of Earthworm Jim than the checkered and barred version. The dithering continues in the level itself. In composite mode, you can see the blending of the shadows of the ground and various bits of shading on the tires to add depth to the scene. Returning to RGB, the dots on the ground as well as the vertical bar makeup for the dithering of the tires can now be seen. Dithering is used in many games for the platform. Whether or not you wish to abandon RGB for composite video in order to experience it is up to you. I hope you enjoyed this examination of dithering for the Sega Genesis. If you would like to see more videos like this one, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment as to whether you have an appreciation for what games did with composite video or 
if RGB is a reason to leave it all behind. If you would like to become a patron, I have provided a link to Patreon in the video description. Thank you very much for watching.